Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Primary Hyperaldosteronism from A to Z. I am Sue Pham from Lab Roots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Diasorin. Diasorin is a global leader in the field of biotechnologies. For more than 40 years, the company has been developing, producing, and commercializing reagent kits for in vitro diagnostics worldwide. It offers the broadest range of specialty tests available in the immunodiagnostics market and continually invests in research and development using its distinctive expertise in the field of immunodiagnostics to deliver a high level of innovation. For more information, please visit diasorin.com. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us comments. Answers are also welcome. You can do this by clicking the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can today. Do you want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon at the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you can't see or hear this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure to resolve any issues. This is an educational web seminar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. <clears throat> now let's get right to today's presenter. We're proud to welcome Dr. Jonathan Williams. Dr. Williams is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and associate physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Hypertension. He has dedicated his research efforts to unraveling the intricate relationship between genetics and environment with respect to individual susceptibility to cardiometabolic disease. He has over 40 original publications describing the physiologic and pathologic interplay of renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity, and dietary salt intake in hypertension, insulin resistance, heart disease, and obesity. Dr. Williams is an active program developer, course director, and mentor for the Harvard Medical School Scholar in Clinical Research Program. I will now turn it over to Dr. Williams for his presentation. Hi, everybody. As Tracy mentioned, my name is Jonathan Williams, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to speak with you all about the topic of primary aldosteronism. I'm actually coming to you today from Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been driving across country, uh, taking my daughter's car out to college for her. So needless to say, I've had quite a bit of time to reflect on this topic the last three days. As mentioned, uh, Diasorin is uh, providing the educational activity support for this presentation today, and I'm grateful to them and also to LabRoots for hosting the broadcast. So I'd like to start with a, a quick case. I understand that there are likely some primary care providers as well as laboratory managers on the, on the webinar today. So I'm going to try to make this applicable to everybody because this might be a story of you or somebody you know. Bob is a typical patient of mine. He's a 44-year-old male with a history of hypertension for the last three years. He was uh, initially treated with a blood pressure medication called amlodipine, 5 milligrams a day, which was escalated to 10 milligrams a day um, over a two-month period. Since this failed to control his blood pressure, a second blood pressure medication was added, lisinopril, and it was increased over the following year. Unfortunately, despite these efforts, Bob's blood pressure remained uncontrolled, as you can see. And I think this is typical of what we see with hypertension uh, treatment. So this is the rest of Bob's story. He has a history of high cholesterol that was diagnosed in his late 30s. He takes a cholesterol-lowering medication as well as a baby aspirin. He has what's called borderline type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. He's obese. He says that his wife states he snores a lot but claims he does not hear this 
um, suggestive of him having perhaps sleep apnea. He has a family history of high blood pressure. He's married, doesn't smoke, um, and he's gainfully employed. When we look at Bob's exam, we note that he's obese, that he has skin changes that are consistent with somebody who might have insulin resistance, which is darkening of the skin folds across the neck. He has a large neck, which we suspected might be the cause for his uh, snoring. And then we see his laboratory data. He has slightly diminished uh, renal function and a normal potassium. Interestingly, his electrocardiogram shows left ventricular hypertrophy. So would you be worried about Bob in this case? And there'd be a couple of things that I think would be a little bit atypical um, in this situation. Uh, the duration of his hypertension is actually short-lived. It's only a few years, at least as what we have recorded. And I think this is often the case in treating patients with hypertension. They might have uh, arrived at a diagnosis, but have had a pre-existing unknown history of hypertension for years. He has evidence of end organ damage and that he appears to already have damage of the kidneys and has uh, ventricular hypertrophy. So it again suggests that he's had long duration and out of control hypertension. And then you'll see he has kind of the typical um, aggregate of comorbidities, which will elevate his risk. He has uh, insulin resistance, uh, prediabetes, um, and he has sleep apnea. So what do you do? Well, you try again. You add a, you throw a third blood pressure medication at Bob, uh, chlorthalidone, which is a diuretic. And a month later, you see there's no effect. And at this point, Bob's asking you, do you even know what you're doing as his treating physician? So both patient and physician are becoming more frustrated. You get laboratory data again, because you had placed him on a diuretic and you note that his potassium has dropped to lower than the lower limit of uh, normal at 3.1. So now what do you do? Well, what we say clinically in training is that when you hear hoof beats in the forest, don't think of zebras, think of common things. And for the most part, common things in this case would just be run in the mill essential hypertension. But since we know this is a talk on primary aldosteronism, actually what I'm showing here is that Bob likely has a condition called primary hyperaldosteronism. <clears throat> All right, first we're gonna talk a little bit about hypertension in general. Um, so for the most part, we categorize this into two sections. Primary, or what's typically known as the essential hypertension, represents about 90% of the hypertensive population. It is strongly heritable. There are a host of mechanisms responsible for it. And the treatment is just as described in this case. It's very nonspecific. And it's actually based on large studies with mean group effects. And I'll describe what, that, what I mean by that in a minute. It's basically treatment on an algorithm approach. And as you can see here, if one medication doesn't work, then you add a second one. And unfortunately, what we found out is that some of these blood pressure medications might even lower blood pressure, but antagonize another system, such as we've recently described that if you salt restrict some people, you can worsen their insulin resistance, even if you lower their blood pressure. And as all treating physicians know, and as demonstrated in this case, compliance with treatment regimens is very poor. If you look at a population drug effect, I think this is a nice way to, to, to kind of view it. You see the frequency of a population response on the y-axis, and then you see the actual response in this situation would be a change in blood pressure or perhaps even the net health benefit listed here. And you can see the mean effect would be in the positive for the population on whole, but there can be negative consequences to portions of the population. This is what's frustrating. And it's basically what I spend my life doing in research is trying to figure out how people develop high blood pressure and how to better treat specifically those individuals. So I mentioned primary hypertension. The other form of hypertension 
grossly described is secondary hypertension. And it represents about 10% of the hypertensive population. We say secondary because we feel that we understand or can identify the mechanism responsible. Therefore, the treatment is actually fairly specific. For example, hypertension that's caused by narrowing of the renal arteries or renal artery stenosis is obvious to fix. There are hormonal mechanisms such as Cushing's disease, pheochromocytoma, or aldosteronism, the topic of today. There are medications such as Sudafed, which will raise blood pressure. So you can see these are easy to identify singular mechanism of hypertension and, when, and can be, for the most part, equally easily treated. So the goal overall in the hypertension treatment world is to transform more primary or unknown mechanistic hypertension into a secondary form of hypertension that we can narrowly treat. So if you look back at our graph here, where we see the population effect, you could superimpose on this primary aldosteronism. So we know if we can identify the population, there is a very specific treatment which has a very robust, robust effect without, with very limited negative effects. And this would be the treatment of spironolactone. We'll get into that a little bit later. So specifically primary aldosteronism is the inappropriate secretion of aldosterone resulting in dysregulated volume homeostasis, potassium wasting and hypertension. It is a singular mechanism. Therefore, as we saw in this case, it is typically resistant to off-target treatments. If you use blood pressure medications that do not specifically target the problem of aldosterone, they will have very little or limited benefit in lowering blood pressure. Unfortunately, it's a very delayed diagnosis if it's even diagnosed. As opposed to primary aldosteronism, secondary aldosterone is actually the normal physiologic stimulation of aldosterone in response to a hypoperfused state. So this might be if there's massive blood loss, well, how the body would respond is to reactively increase the production or and the secretion of aldosterone in order to maintain circulating blood volume. There are specific clinical conditions in which we see this also, such as congestive heart failure and cirrhosis. So why, what's the importance of primary aldosteronism? Why, why are we actually discussing this at this time? Well, it actually has to do with the updated endocrine society guidelines that were just released about a month ago, in which they claim and state that this is a real public health problem, that it's being underdiagnosed and undertreated, and that if you look at the primary hypertensive population, it actually consists of a sizable portion. Why does this matter? Well, as we just described, it's specifically treatable. You can even cure primary aldosteronism, yet no one seems to be doing much about it clinically. It's often perceived as a rare disease and it can be confusing to even screen for it. The second and perhaps most important reason is that aldosterone can be a bad player beyond blood pressure. We see that if you have primary aldosteronism, you will have high blood pressure, but you will also be predisposed to developing a multitude of conditions, including aggressive heart failure, increased left ventricular hypertrophy, kidney disease, stroke, coronary disease. All these conditions contribute to a decreased mortality in patients that have primary aldosteronism, even if they have the same level of blood control as other patients without aldosteronism. So let me just give you a quick little history of the story of um, aldosterone. And this is uh, uh, a fun review I got to do a historical perspective um, a few years ago regarding the 50th anniversary of its discovery. 
Um, actually, in 1563, uh, the Italian Bartolomeo Estaccio was the first to describe the adrenal glands, and he etched it upon copper plates. And if we advance forward to 1849, uh, Thomas Addison, the father of Addison's disease, described that the destruction of an adrenal gland leads to death. And the 1930s, glucocorticoids were discovered. Um, yet there was known that within the adrenal gland, there was another hormone that appeared to influence the metabolism of sodium and potassium. In 1953, uh, the group here, and I'd focus on Simpson, who is the female seated at the table, and to her left is her future husband, uh, Tate. And they were the two that first described electrocortin. And they actually did so by uh, synthesizing, uh, or sorry about that, um, actually taking uh, over a, a ton, almost a ton of beef adrenal glands and to identify 21 milligrams of electrocortin which is later described as uh, aldosterone. Interestingly, even back in the 1950s, it was identified that beyond blood pressure control and regulation of potassium, that the mineralic corticoid aldosterone appeared to have influence in fibrosis and inflammation. Here we see a, a pictograph that shows the three layers of the adrenal cortex, the zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And then below that is the adrenal medulla. The top layer, the zona glomerulosa, is where the aldosterone secretion and production uh, occurs. Kahn syndrome is probably the most familiar uh, representation clinically of hyperaldosterone. It was described in 1955 as hyperaldosteronism arising from an adrenal tumor that presented with hypertension and profound hypokalemia. This is perhaps where the concept of a rare disease in this regard uh, came about as it was defined as only less than 1% of hypertensives having this form of hypertension. In the ensuing two or three decades, the mechanisms of regulation of aldosterone production and secretion were identified. First, the main component, angiotensin II via renin and sodium restriction was identified in 1958. A year later, spironolactone, the first mineralocorticoid receptor blocker was introduced. In 1962, it was described that ACTH from the pituitary gland also stimulated aldosterone secretion, although it was a weak player. And then by 1972, it was described that potassium and sodium played a role in regulating the response to um, angiotensin II and renin and aldosterone secretion. But wait, there's more, of course. We're talking about hormones, and of course, there has to be feedback loops. Uh, this is intended to be complicated, but what I want to point out here is that aldosterone's main job is to increase circulating blood volume. Where there might be other hormones such as angiotensin II and sympathetically active hormones that increase vascular tone to raise blood pressure, aldosterone increases blood pressure by increasing the amount of circulating volume. So how rare isn't it? Well, I think this is the easiest way to uh, look at conditions such as primary aldosteronism. Here we see on the y-axis uh, the disease burden, the cost, and the degree of irreversibility of a disease process. And you can put any disease process here. Uh, you can see that for the most part, diseases such as primary aldosteronism likely occur at, with a genetic defect at birth. And then they develop into a clinical condition later in life. And the degree to which somebody can detect that detection, uh, uh, to detect the onset of, of aldosteronism depends on whether you're looking and then whether you have the tools to do so. Now, unfortunately, what we're seeing with primary aldosteronism is that the detection and realization is not occurring until very, very late in the disease process. 
for the majority of patients. And this is important because once things are let loose and untreated for decades of time, the damage is typically already done and very difficult to reverse. So what we need to do is push our levels of detection uh, more to the right side of this figure. The prevalence. <clears throat> so this is actually the number one hormonal cause of secondary hypertension, uh, as opposed to pheochromocytoma or Cushing's disease. In fact, primary hypertension in general, it appears that about 6% of the population has aldosteronism or primary hyperaldosteronism. And if you look at it by stage of hypertension, and this would mean that the severity of hypertension, we see that as the severity increases, you see an increasing prevalence of primary hyperaldosteronism. And I think it's important to realize that what this likely means is uh, as we're, we're catching the disease process far too late in some of these clinical course. If you look at the most severe forms of hypertension, such as resistant hypertension, which we typically define um, as we saw in this clinical case of Bob, uh, a blood pressure that's sustained above 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, despite the use of three antihypertensives, including a diuretic, or the use of four antihypertensives. And if you look specifically within this population, the prevalence of primary aldosteronism is 17 to 23%. This is a strikingly uh, troublesome figure in that it means most likely that primary aldosteronism has gone undetected for many, many years up to this point. Finally, um, an interesting study came out a few years ago in which patients who had obstructive sleep apnea and new onset hypertension, about a third of them were found to have primary aldosteronism. And I mentioned this specifically for an upcoming reason. So there are several forms of primary aldosteronism. It actually represents a group of disorders. The largest by far is what we termed for now sporadic primary aldosteronism. And there are essentially three flavors. The first and the second rep represent half of the population each. Uh, the first is uh, what we would describe as Kahn syndrome. And this is what Dr. Kahn described. It's an adrenal adenoma, a benign aldosterone secreting tumor that occurs in one side of the adrenal gland here. And typically the contralateral adrenal gland is somewhat atrophied in response to the high aldosterone burden. Radiographically, it's a very uh, well-defined encapsulated tumor. I would say for the most part ranging between one to two or three centimeters maximum. The second flavor of primary aldosteronism is bilateral hypertrophy. And as we see here, this represents uh, increased production of aldosterone in both glands. And this typically has a genetic um, underpinning uh, mechanism responsible for it. Very rarely, but important to recognize, is that adrenal carcinoma or primary adrenal cancer can present with symptoms and signs consistent with primary aldosteronism. And on imaging, they're usually very large tumors and they secrete a variety of hormones and hormone byproducts and metabolites in addition to aldosterone. Rarely, but increasingly important and recognized are the familial forms of primary aldosteronism. Presently, we've identified three types, type one, two, and three. Um, as I mentioned, they're fairly rare, but what we've identified is that in um, type two, uh, it appears that a large portion of those likely have a genetic mutation that we also see in adrenal adenomas. Type one is a condition which is important to recognize clinically. Type one also goes by the name 
glucocorticoid remedial hyperaldosteronism. And it is a genetic defect in which the promoter for cortisol is fused in front of the aldosterone secreting or producing hormone aldosterone synthase. As such, these patients present very young with very severe forms of hypertension and the phenotype of early onset strokes. So clinically, if you have a patient who's of young age between late teens and early 20s, who has a family history of strokes at a young age and presents with hypertension and low potassium, it's important to realize that, that screening for this form of aldosteronism uh, should be undertaken. So what is the screening process for uh, primary aldosteronism? Well, most people say, I know it when I see it. And they typically describe these telltale signs of patients with primary aldosteronism. These patients, it is considered, are often young, but in reality, this is rarely the case. It's often a very loud presentation of severe hypertension. And again, this is very rarely the case and that they present with hypertension and hypokalemia, or low potassium. Again, in the majority of patients who have primary aldosteronism, they actually do not present with low potassium levels. As such, as I mentioned, the Endocrine Society updated their screening guidelines for primary care providers for primary aldosteronism. And these are the six points they made for case detection. First, if somebody has a sustained blood pressure of 150 over 100 millimeters of mercury, despite the use of these medications, they should be screened for primary aldosteronism. In addition, classic findings of hypertension with hypokalemia should be screened. Hypertension with an adrenal nodule, or otherwise known as an adrenal incidentaloma, about 2% of these end up having primary aldosteronism, which should be screened as such. As I mentioned in this most recent study, patients who have hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea have a very high likelihood of having primary aldosteronism. As I mentioned before, if there's a family history of young stroke victims and hypertension, they should be screened for primary aldosteronism and all primary relatives of a patient who's diagnosed with primary aldosteronism. So if you consider all six of these factors together, this actually could represent a fairly large subset of the primary care provider's hypertensive population. How do we do it? Well, I think this is the important part, and I think it's very, perhaps, one of the most troublesome parts of the screening process for primary care providers. This is probably the easiest way I can describe it. Why do we use this uh, laboratory study called the aldosterone renin ratio? Well, renin is actually the main circulating volume gauge. So renin is a hormone secreted by the kidney. It does so in response to either low circulating volume or low salt in the, uh, or sodium. Uh, which results to a stimulated or high level of renin. The opposite is true. If there is a high circulating volume and a high salt content in that volume, then renin secretion will be suppressed and the values will be low. The next thing is to consider how aldosterone works. Aldosterone, as I mentioned, is the main circulating volume contributor. So if renin's job is to gauge or detect how much volume there is, and aldosterone's job is to increase volume, you can see this relationship. So sorry to mention this, but I'm an endocrinologist and endocrinologists live on feedback loops. So we'll go through this scenario. If renin is elevated physiologically, then aldosterone is probably elevated too, because we see in this feedback loop that renin eventually leads to the production of angiotensin II, which stimulates aldosterone release 
which will increase circulating blood volume. As the volume expands, this will down-regulate renin release and peel back on aldosterone secretion. If aldosterone is autonomous, which is what we would see in primary aldosteronism, then you could see the feedback loop will be impaired. Aldosterone release will go up autonomously, the circulating blood volume will expand, and renin will be suppressed and should be suppressed essentially down to zero as the volume continues to expand. So if we look at the ratio, we would typically see an elevated aldosterone and a very low renin. And it's probably easiest to integrate this into a ratio such that high ratios, high aldosterone or low renin, would provide evidence of an inappropriate aldosterone secretion. So that being said, you have to realize the power of the denominator. <clears throat> For example, let's say we had an aldosterone level drawn on a patient, which in, resulted in five nanograms per deciliter. This would actually be considered a fairly normal level of aldosterone for most westernized diets. The renin activity measured with that patient might be very, very low at 0 0.1. This would be probably at the lower limits of detection for that particular assay. And if you convert this into a aldo renin ratio, you would have a very high ratio of 50, and this would be considered completely abnormal. Most ratios fall less than 20. But in this scenario, it doesn't appear to be because of a very elevated aldosterone, but just a very, very suppressed renin influencing the denominator effect. So for this reason, most experts advocate that in addition to an absolute, that in addition to an elevated aldosterone renin ratio, you should also have an absolute cutoff for aldosterone in the upper range. The assays. So this is the next most important part of um, determining how to uh, interpret aldo-renin ratios. For the most part, there are two general approaches to measuring renin. Uh, the classic approach would be plasma renin activity. Renin is an enzyme whose job it is to cleave angiotensin 1. Sorry. Renin's job is to cleave angiotensinogen in order to form angiotensin 1. The enzymatic assay that's used measures the speed at which that's done. It's a rate that is generated. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's a very cumbersome assay and it's, it's expensive uh, to perform. It takes a lot of technical time. Um, and it's actually sensitive to poor sample handling such that if, if the, the samples are frozen at the wrong time, this can influence the activity of ringing in and give false results. Um, it's a fairly reproducible assay, but it's very not as sensitive at lower levels. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, one of the main influences of renin activity is how much salt is in the diet. And if there's a high salt diet, which is typical of most westernized diets, then renin levels are generally suppressed. And this can be a problem when creating a ratio, as I already mentioned. For the most part, and the, the assays vary, uh, the normal values for a seeded morning renin, plasma renin activity would be between one and four nanograms of angiotensin one per cc per hour. The next way to measure renin is actually directly measure how much renin is produced. So it's not an, uh, an activity assay, it's actually a concentration detection. And this can be done through automated immunometric assays. The advantage of this approach over plasma renin activity is that it can be very, very fast. It can be easy. It's not as technical. Um, it, it's, uh, unfortunately, renin itself uh, doesn't affect blood pressure. Renin activity or the enzymatic process is what affects blood pressure. So that could be considered a limitation by some. Um, and it's substrate dependent. So how much renin is created depends on the estrogen state of an individual. 
the normal values are typically reported between 8 and 35 milliunits per liter. Um, the, as uh, the, the Endocrine Society updated guidelines have indicated, the easiest way to kind of convert direct renin concentrations from plasma renin activity is to multiply by eight. So the suggested screening cutoff values, uh, ratios, uh, are, are listed here below. Um, and these are, would be typical of what we'd see for primary aldosteronism. Uh, there's a table down below which shows uh, plasma aldosterone concentration on the left-hand columns and then the different forms of plasma activity versus direct renin concentration across the top. And then there's SI unit designation and conventional designation listed. A typical strongly suggested elevated ratio using plasma renin activity would require a value of renin that's very low and an elevated plasma aldosterone. Uh, usually this would be between 20 to 40 as a ratio. For direct renin concentration, we would require a value typically less than four uh, milliunits per liter with a similarly elevated plasma aldosterone concentration and an aldosterone to direct renin ratio of greater than 3.7. The reason why there's so many different cutoffs is part of the problem, and it's why the aldosterone, uh, sorry, the endocrine society um, wants a focus to be placed on unifying uh, cutoff values. The next most common obstacle in deciding whether to obtain an aldosterone renin ratio is that all the antihypertensive medications or a majority of them that are used can influence renin and aldosterone. For example, uh, diuretic hormone, di sorry, diuretic blood pressure medications actually raise renin. They create a diuresis or a dehydration effect, which lowers blood volume. And as we mentioned before, this stimulates renin. Beta blockers actually suppress renin secretion through sympathetic stimulation. Mineralocorticoid receptor drugs such as spironolactone block the mineralocorticoid receptor. This antagonizes aldosterone secretion and levels are very, very high. ACE inhibitors and ARBs can do all of the above. Next, optimizing conditions. <clears throat> it's important that when you're testing for aldosterone renin ratios in a screening process, that you make sure your serum potassium is as close to normal as possible. If somebody has a low potassium, then you should try to correct that before you measure the aldosterone renin ratio. If they're on a diuretic, you should discontinue it for the reasons I just mentioned. If you're on a mineralocorticoid receptor agent such as spironolactone, it too should be discontinued. To enhance the aldosterone renin ratio effect, it should be encouraged some moderate increase in salt intake. And then importantly, these hormonal assays should be drawn um, in the morning after two hours in an upright or seated position. The points to consider, and these for the most part are minor in my, in my view. Premenopausal women have higher aldosterone renin ratios. This has more to do with estrogen release and in the luteal phase. So this can affect direct renin assays. Renin in general decreases with age. We're not sure why this occurs, but above the age of 65 years, renins decrease. Chronic kidney disease can, be, can influence the aldosterone renin ratio. If renin is being produced by the kidney, yet the kidney itself is damaged, you can quickly see how that's going to impair the interpretation of a ratio and should be referred to a specialist. However, all this being said, what the Endocrine Society update is calling for is to simplify the screening process in order to enhance case detection. It is clear that not enough case detection is going on right now if we're seeing that upwards of 20% of the hypertensive population has primary aldosteronism. As such, they are calling for establishing universal 
assay standards for both aldosterone and renin, whether it be renin activity or renin concentrations, and to facilitate point of care capacity. So this is where it appears that direct renin measurements are going to be favored and um, as we move towards automizing, uh, automating and facilitating uh, aldorenin ratio measurements. Uh, direct renin concentrations may have some very minor limitations, but in the setting of wanting to increase a screening assay's use, uh, those should really not be an issue. Um, as I mentioned before, don't be as concerned with the various antihypertensive medications that a patient might be taking or their possible influence on uh, the aldosterone renin ratio. It would be better to obtain the aldosterone renin ratio and then refer the result to a specialist for interpretation. Now, the exceptions would be to make sure that hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothalidone, other diuretic medications be tapered off beforehand, if possible. Finally, referral to, to, uh, uh, to a specialist would be required at this point for confirmation. So as with any screening test, the, the, it is just meant to enhance the ability to, to, to identify a possible case, but confirmation is required. And very quickly, how we do that is we establish that aldosterone is actually being autonomously secreted. The easiest way to do this is to salt load somebody or volume load. As I mentioned in the feedback circle, if a high volume or a high salt uh, diet is introduced into a patient, the normal response should be to decrease aldosterone secretion. As such, if you load somebody with salt, and they still have an elevated aldosterone, that is confirming that they have autonomous secretion or primary aldosteronism. The next step is to subtype. As I mentioned, there's two major forms of aldosteronism. Uh, this can be determined most easily with a CAT scan. It allows you to determine if there's an adrenal cancer, if there's a very large tumor on one side of the adrenal gland that looks cancerous, that would be important to know. It also can help the possible uh, future surgical interventions. Adrenal incidentalomas, though, increase with age. So there's, as people age, there's more likely to be uh, the presence of an adrenal uh, tumor on CT imaging. And this is why the next step would be to determine lateralization. Now, what we suggest is that only try to determine lateralization or whether a tumor is on one side or both sides, if a patient is gonna go for surgery. If they are not, either because they do not desire surgery or they do not seem appropriate for surgery, then medical therapy would be started. If surgery is an option, then what we typically do is proceed to adrenal vein sampling. This must be done through a specialist that involves the use of catheters that are threaded into the left and right adrenal glands to determine whether one side is over secreting versus both sides over secreting. The medical therapy right now is essentially two major drugs. The mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, the first spironolactone, as I mentioned, was discovered in, or synthesized in 1953. It's consequently very cheap, very potent. It's convenient, it's taken once a day. Obviously, there's a risk of hyperkalemia as it blocks aldosterone, and more so if a patient has concomitant renal disease. Unfortunately, there's a fairly significant dose-dependent risk of breast development in men or gynecomastia, which occurs between five and 25% of patients on spironolactone. A newer agent, a plerinone, uh, was developed about 10 to 15 years ago. It's uh, consequently more specific um, in that it does not have the uh, risk of gynecomastia, but it is also not as potent and it costs considerably more money to prescribe. Surgery versus medical therapy. There's been a lot of back and forth about whether a surgical option is better than just placing somebody on medical therapy. Uh, there are no real good solid studies um, 
comparing the two. But in general, it's felt that surgery might be more cost effective, especially in the young patients. Um, so in those patients, surgery appears to be pre preferred. Um, unfortunately, you need to have a very experienced laparoscopic surgeon who knows how to do this type of surgery in order for its benefit to be gained. And you have to be able to trust the lateralization data of, given by the adrenal vein sampling results. F, the effective treatments, whether they're surgery or medical, are these. Uh, blood pressure improves with surgery up to one year after surgery. Uh, there is always, an, or excuse me, there is typically the need for continued additional blood pressure medication. Um, medical therapy, spironolactone at very low doses, lowers blood pressure by about a quarter in most patients. This equates to losing about a half a blood pressure medication in that population. However, the effects beyond blood pressure are what's important. There is improved cardiovascular risk, improved progression to chronic kidney disease and strokes, and mortality outcomes are improved with blockade or removal of aldosterone. So in conclusion, primary aldosterone is a prevalent and actually virulent, but uniquely treatable form of hypertension. Case detection should be instituted if sustained blood pressure hypertension is, uh, is seen despite the use of an aggressive blood pressure program, regardless of whether a patient has hypokalemia. The best way to test is to have morning aldosterone and renin, renin testing done without withdrawal of hypertensive medications aside from thiazides. Elevated aldosterone renin ratios should prompt referral to a specialist for the confirmation testing and management. So in conclusion, we'll go back to our figure here of case detection. The push from endocrinologists and the endocrine society is that we hopefully will identify in an earlier time course individuals who have primary aldosteronism such that more specific and directed therapy can be invoked to, pr to provide more effective results. Thanks for your attention and be happy to take any questions at this time. That was an excellent presentation, Dr. Williams. Thank you for bringing that information to us. It was terrific. Uh, before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. So questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Just type in your questions, hit send, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today. So our first question for Dr. Williams is, is there a preference of measurement of plasma renin activity or direct renin? So the, there's not, there doesn't appear to be a preference at this time. I would say that uh, plasma renin activity historically has been used more than direct renin concentrations. Um, as pointed out in the endocrine guidelines most recently released, um, direct renin concentrations probably will have favored status down the road simply because it's a much easier assay to conduct. It is not as expensive. Um, there is increasing amounts of data that supports that direct renin concentrations and plasma renin activities correlate. Um, so the hope is that any assay that is going to improve or enhance the ability or facilitate uh, the provider's ability to order and screen for uh, primary aldosteronism will um, be the more favored um, assay. There's certainly, uh, in, in academic circles, I would say, there's um, back and forth regarding the, the uh, advantages of one assay over the other, but I would fall back to the Endocrine Society's recommendation that we do what we can to enhance and improve 
facilitate the screening process.